Welcome to another edition of Sports Insider. I'm Dan Lobby. He's Chris Fedor. Uh, Bud Shaw is sitting off to the side here. We're going to have his spinoffs uh, a little bit later in the episode. Look at that camera angle. You can see all of us. This is great. All right. Uh, we're, we've got a packed show, as always. We're yeah. going to talk Cavaliers and LeBron James with Joe Varden here right off the top. Then we're going to talk Browns and free agency or... I don't know if they're aware free agency has started. We'll talk to Mary Kay Cabot about that. And then we're going to talk spring training with Paul Hoynes and, like I said, Bud Shaw spinoffs. But first, let's get right to it. Joe Varden joins us via phone. Joe, how are you? I'm great. I'm uh, watching Tina Fey Mozgov uh, work on some post moves here uh, live at Shoot Around in San Antonio. Very nice. And speaking of San Antonio, that's where they are tonight. And uh, if there's one team that has sort of been LeBron's nemesis throughout his career, it's the San Antonio Spurs, Joe. I mean, even the year they beat them in the finals and took that miracle shot from Ray Allen in, in game six, what is it about this team? Is it just because they're really good, or is there something in particular that they do to LeBron James? Well, A, they're really good, and they've been really good for a really long time, and no one who's listening to this show or watching this show doesn't know that. Um, obviously, uh, but, but yeah, they, they do defend him. They, they've figured out a way to put a body on him on the perimeter and to help as soon as LeBron gets into the lane in a way that just no other team has been able to do that. Um, they've also had particular personnel that are capable of, of carrying out that assignment. First, you know, Bruce Bowen, now uh, Kawhi Leonard. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's his toughest matchup every year. Joe, LeBron and the whole team has used a one-game-at-a-time mantra. But do you sense something bigger with this one? For LeBron in particular, it's the first time he's going to the AT&T Center since losing in the NBA Finals. Do you expect him to have a different approach? Well, he's, he's talking right now um, as we speak, uh, and he may, he may be talking about that. I know that yesterday he was pretty low-key about it. Yeah. And, and that's because it is a, um, it's a regular season game. And LeBron's mind it is definitely focused on April. Um, and it, everything that they do now is to get ready for April. So, you know, I'm sure in his heart of hearts, he's got this one circled. I mean, let's not forget how the last time they played, how that ended. I mean, it ended with LeBron getting his, pick, his pocket picked, um, trying to dribble ball the floor down one or two points um, at home. And so, you know, he knows. Uh, but, but, I really, I feel like his focus is more on what's to come instead of just one particular regular season game. Speaking of that, Joe, obviously in the Eastern Conference, there's not a lot of competition uh, as far as playoff spots and things like that. It's not like the West. So the Cavs are going to be able to rest some guys. LeBron James specifically said that he'd like to get some rest before the playoffs. What do you think Coach Blatt is going to do there? Is he going to take the, the old Mike Brown approach of just sitting LeBron James for like three games at the end of the year, or will he kind of space it out a little bit, if he even chooses to sit him? Well, first of all, he will sit him. Let's not, let's not get it twisted. He, I mean, LeBron is going to rest, for sure. Um, that, that will happen, and that's been a plan since almost immediately after he rested the first time and he came back like gangbusters. Uh, they started talking then about, wanting to rest him later in the year, but not sure how much they'd be able to do it because of their current position. And then they just basically went two months without losing, um, and so now they're in a position to be able to do that. Um, how, it, how it breaks down does remain to be seen. Um, I mean, you can almost rest assured that he will not play one of the two games of the back-to-back -back in April. Um, I would be a little surprised if he plays on Sunday. Uh, I guess the reason why he would is because he'll have two full days off before that one. So we'll see. Um, but, yeah, he's, de he's definitely going to rest. And he uh, just because the benefits were so, so strong uh, the first time he did it. Sean Marion is set to return any time now, Joe. He's not going to play tonight against San Antonio. It could be Sunday. could be Monday. David Blatt said the other day. could be on this four-game road trip. Do you anticipate Sean Marion's return coinciding with when LeBron could actually get some rest? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good thought, Chris. Um, that would make some sense just because then you'd have some room to work Sean in. I mean, right now, they're not really thinking about it that way. I mean, they're not mm -hmm. thinking about Sean in that way. They, they like what they've been getting out of James Jones. Um, so that would be a way to, to create some space to get him in. Um, I don't believe Sean's going to be there tonight. So, you know, we're waiting and seeing. Yeah, I mean, so, so Sunday could make sense in that regard, too. LeBron's headband, yes or no tonight? <laughs> 
You know what? He told me yesterday it was a game time decision. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. No, we'll see. <laughs> The saga of the headband. That's that's how far this team has come, Joe. Instead of yes. you know, stressing out about can they win the East, it's become all about LeBron's headband. I know. I mean, he's, he played really good the other night without it, and he looks comfortable without it. Um, you know, it's just however he feels at the moment. I mean, it's, it's silly. It's like the chalk box. You know, it doesn't matter except for the fact that it's something on the periphery that he's known for, and he hasn't done that. He hasn't done that thing in two months. Um and he's played pretty darn good without without tossing them to the top them into the air. So, you know, uh, I, I could see a scenario where we don't see that headband for a while. Joe, you have a story on Cleveland.com about J.R. Smith, and I remember being there on that Tuesday night or whatever night it was when uh, there were rumors about the Cavs trading Dion Waiters, and the first name that popped up at that time was Iman Shumpert, and I got the sense that fans were really, really excited because it was a defender, it was a young, up-and-coming guy, he was somebody that was on fans' radar screens, and then all of a sudden, JR pops up, and fans are like, oh boy, <laughs> that guy's volatile, yeah. he might be able to break up the Cavs' locker room. He's been really, really good. What do you think it is about him in this situation on this team? Well, I I... He and LeBron are almost like kindred spirits. Mm. Um, they are they are uh, alike. And and you say, well, how is that possible when you talk about LeBron, who's seldom made any mistakes on or off the floor, um, despite all the money that's been thrown his way? And you have J.R. Smith, who's racked up a million dollars in fines over his ten or eleven year career. But they, they are, they, they have similar personalities. They really click. Um, and, and JR is first and foremost comfortable here because of that relationship with LeBron. Um, but then beyond that, I mean, everyone has kind of embraced him. And he, it all comes back to this fact that he is professional enough to know that he could fit into, into this system by standing on the perimeter and waiting for the ball and trying to make something happen when, when something needs to, to happen that way. Um, and he's just flourished as a result. He's, he's played defense, which has just been something they weren't expecting. Um, and I think he has like one technical in the two months that he's been here. Um, he's just, he's been great. And it's just a combination of him being smart enough to recognize the opportunity that he had and also the uh, surroundings. Joe, we all saw the Instagram picture, of course, too, another one of those periphery things. But, uh, you know, when, when you see things like that, you wonder, you know, how close is this basketball team? Obviously, that, that photo makes it look like it, but is that the reality? Is this team gelling and coming together? Well, you know, I mean, like, I'm going to preface this by saying, when things were going bad, you know, the players would try to suggest, like, well, you're not around all the time, so there, there's things that you don't see. But, we're around enough to see enough. And what I see now is not at all what I saw in November, December, and January. Just the, just the genuine kinship um, of the guys and just like how they laugh and how they hang out and how they interact. I mean, LeBron interacts in a way with these players that he absolutely did not, simply, unequivocally did not for, for two or three months. I mean, he is in the middle of it. They, I mean, you know, I can't even describe you what they were doing before practice yesterday, but there was four of them, and they kind of had this, like, circle in the stands at the church gym where they practiced, and they were, like, doing some kind of, like, rap and dance and just cracking each other up, and you never saw that, and now you see it every day. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, this, this team almost has, like, that college feel right now in terms of its closeness and and um that's good to see i, I hope for their sake that it lasts <laughs> all right joe varden joining us here on sports insider thanks for the time joe thank you Tom. thanks guys all right uh, that instagram photo on a plane yeah uh, you know it is what it is it's good to see if you're looking for team chemistry and, and that's kind of something lebron i think is always comfortable with yep. some guys you look at and their adversarial guy, like Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Like, he, he doesn't care about being friends right. with guys. LeBron's never well, been that guy. Yeah. He's always been a guy that likes that college atmosphere and, and things like that. 
LeBron said when he came here to Cleveland that he wanted to build this thing like a family. He wanted to change that culture because that's what he had in Miami. That's what he had the first time around in Cleveland, actually. If you remember all those snapping the photos yeah. and the pregame introductions, he wants that camaraderie. That's the kind of team he wants to build. And he has that now. And I'm with Joe. I didn't see that in October, November, December. The locker room has completely changed. All right, let's switch gears and talk Browns free agency. We'll bring in our Browns beat reporter, Mary Kay Cabot, now via phone. Mary Kay, how are you? I'm fine, guys. How are you doing? All right, well, Mary Kay, the Browns <laughs> said leading up to free agency they were not going to be real busy in free agency or real active, and it turns out they weren't joking about that. I know. They delivered on their promise, didn't they? About that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they, they haven't been real active, although when you look at it, uh, you know, they kind of got a jump on things a little bit by signing Josh McCown and Brian Hartline. And I know that, again, we've discussed this, that the Josh McCown uh, signing has gone over like a lead balloon in this town. Uh, but I, I actually do think people might be a little bit more surprised. I've talked to uh, some coaches in the NFL that have said, hey, the, the stuff that went down with him in Tampa Bay last year was not his fault. Uh, some have told me that they, you know, if they had to start a game tomorrow, they would rather start uh, Josh McCown over Brian Hoyer. I think we've talked about that before. Um, so, you know, in terms of a bridge quarterback, I don't think uh, that that was a bad signing at all. When you look at what's going on right now, look, they weren't going to be able to get Jake Locker. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't going to be able to get Mark Sanchez. There was really nothing that was going to be available. And they jumped on that opportunity uh, now, having said all that, I will say that I still think that they're going to make a big pitch for Marcus Mariota. Hmm. I think all the signs are pointing in that direction. And I don't know if they'll be able to get their hands on him, but I think they're going to try. I was just going to ask you, Mary Kay, how you feel the flurry of activity for the Browns about at the two signings, I mean, is going to affect the uh, first round of the draft. They've got two picks, 12 and 19. Some people have thought for quite some time, wide receiver, probably one of those. Maybe they are going to make a move for Mariota. Has anything that has happened this offseason in terms of the Browns' losses and acquisitions changed the plan? Well, you know what? No, not necessarily. I mean, I think that uh, I don't think anything that they've done so far uh, will have a, a tremendously huge impact on what they're going to continue to do. I don't think that... Uh, signing Josh McCown means that now you're not going to go out and try to uh, get a quarterback in the draft. So I, I still see them uh, trying to package 12 and 19 and moving up to get Mariota. Uh, again, that comes from no inside knowledge. Mm -hmm. All of that is is a gut feeling and a hunch on my part. When I put it all into the hopper, that's what I, that's what I see, that's what I feel. Um, you know, including the whole Kevin O'Connell thing. So, um, so, no, I don't think that, that changes anything. And I don't think Brian Hartline uh, would preclude them, obviously, from, you know, trying to go out and, and you know, get a Parker or, or a very good wide receiver in this draft. Mary Kay, when it comes to trading up for Marcus Mariota, is there a specific uh, number that you think they have to get to? Do you think they have to get to number five in front of the New York Jets? Do you think the Jets is the most likely destination? What, what are you thinking there? Well, you know, it's going to be a tough one because you just don't really know. You, not only do you have to look at those teams that might want him, you have to look at the, the places where other teams might trade up ahead of you, mm. right? You know, yeah. I mean, you can't just wait and think that, you know, nothing's going to happen at, you know, three, four, whatever the case may be. So uh, th this is going to be tricky. If they really do want him, uh, and again, you know, the, the Titans are sending a, a large contingent to the pro day today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these guys might end up going one and two. So, you know, it might not be doable in any way, shape, or form. I mean, but if it is, you might have to go all the way up to, you know, one or two. Uh, Mary Kay, there was speculation, of course, when Chip Kelly said that somebody called and offered him a first rounder for Sam Bradford that maybe it could have been the Browns. Do you think it could have been the Browns? Yeah, I think it could have been. I haven't uh, been able to pin it down yet, and I've, I've worked hard to try to find that out, of course, but uh, I haven't been able to get anybody to tell me that it was the Browns yet, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. It would not surprise me uh, at all, because uh, if it's true that they really liked Sam Bradford that much, and they have number 12 and, and number 19, uh, then, you know, 
I, I could see that happening. I don't know if it was, but it wouldn't shock me. Uh, Mary Kay, Buster Screen to the New York Jets, Brian Hoyer to the Houston Texans, Jabal Sheard to the New England Patriots. It would seem the next guy on that list of guys who could potentially depart, Jordan Cameron, the tight end. Some people were thinking maybe Seattle when the first uh, start of free agency hit, but obviously Seattle has Jimmy Graham. Do the Browns still want Jordan Cameron back? Is there um, a percentage chance of him coming back that you see? Once a guy starts going out and making visits, the chances mm -hmm. of him signing somewhere else uh, increase dramatically. Mm -hmm. So he is at that point now, and my guess is he probably will sign somewhere else. Uh, however, you know, I think that the Browns wanted to, you know, let him go out and see what kind of offers that he could get. And, you know, I think that the idea was to, you know, let the market set the price a little bit and then maybe revisit it at that point. So, you know, if Miami doesn't come through with a, a huge offer or, um, or any other team at this point, if they don't come up with a, a, a big offer, you know, I, I wouldn't rule out. But, you know, with the way it looks in Miami, with them getting uh, set to possibly lose Charles Clay, uh, I would imagine that, you know, they, they might want to get Jordan Cameron wrapped up pretty quickly. Uh, Mary Kay, when you look at Jordan Cameron and teams wanting to invest money in him, I mean, we know the concussion history. We know the guys are starting to retire early all of a sudden as well. <laughs> uh, that's got to be in the back of everyone's mind as well. It could take one hit to, to essentially end Jordan Cameron's career. Well, that's true, but there have been other guys in the NFL that have played with a concussion history and that have made money and gone to teams and, um, you know, Ben Watson being one of those guys. Uh, and they, those guys know each other and they've talked. So I, I still think that someone, you know, will, and they'll, they'll do their due diligence and they'll look at the, uh, you know, they'll have their doctors look at the scans and things like that. But I, I think someone will pay Jordan Cameron to play football for them. Darrell Rivas signs with the New York Jets. How real was the Browns' interest in Rivas, Mary Kay? Well, I don't get the sense that, you know, they were clamoring after him. I think that they actually last year uh, probably went way harder after him than they did this year. Mm. But I did think it was significant that they at least inquired about him. They uh, expressed interest in him again, and I think that shows that, you know, they are willing uh, to try to, to do whatever it takes to uh, improve the talent on this team. And it's not a crazy phone call for them to make uh, because uh, Darrell Rivas really did love playing for Mike Patton. And, you know, so that says something. But to try to lure him away from uh, either an opportunity to win a Super Bowl or to be in New York, that, that was going to be a, a tall order. Mary Kay, there's a lot of offseason left. There's a lot of free agency <laughs> left, even after that initial flurry. There's still the draft. Uh, there's still the Johnny Manziel situation playing out. Uh, this early on, is, is it too early to really judge what the Browns have done, and do fans have a right to be frustrated with what, the lack of activity from this team? You know what? I think it's too early. You have to judge the offseason uh, in, in totality. You can't do it now. There's no way. I mean, you know, it, it's always an emotional roller coaster. I mean, look, look back at the years when, uh, you know, people were wondering what was going on, and then they went out and, and drafted, you know, Brandon Whedon and, and Trent Richardson that year, and, and everyone thinks that, you know, now good times are going to roll. So you, you have to wait. There's two first-round picks again. I mean, you can transfer, you can transform a team if you get those picks right uh, with just your first round of the draft. So I think people need to, you know, exercise some patience and, and kind of see what they're trying to do here. All right, Mary Kay Cabot, our Browns beat reporter, joining us. Mary Kay, thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with her. It's frustrating that the Browns weren't on board mm -hmm. with this big free agent frenzy, but until we see what they do in the draft, and look, if they make a deal to move up and get a guy like Marcus Mariota, yeah. it's going to be hard to look back at this offseason and say they didn't do a good job. Okay. So there's still a lot to play out. Yes. I would say that that is fair. That's a reasonable approach that you're taking there. Um, at the same time, I mean, I'm not just going to sit here and assume that what they're going to do in the draft is going to be the correct thing. And, and so you're, you're right to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to judge them on the moves that they have made. And at this point right now on March 12th, the players that have left the organization are better than the ones that have come to the organization. And that's all I can judge. I'm not just going to sit here and say, well, you know, I'm going to let it play out. They'll go get a wide receiver. They'll go get this. They'll go get that. 
No, because there's no guarantee that they're going to. They've taken an approach that um, is one that I don't think they should be taking when they need an influx of talent. And we remember what happened with those two first round picks uh, last year. Oh yeah, those were home runs. <laughs> home runs. Something like that. I know what you're talking about, Dan. They got the two worst players from the first round of last year. Speaking of home runs, let's bring in our Indians beat reporter, Paul Hoynes. How's that for a, uh, there for you a go. segue? Nice. Uh, Paul Hoynes joining us from Arizona. Trevor Bauer gave up three home runs, Hoynesy, the other day. Should we be worried? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I think you got to take into account, though, the guys he gave him up to. Those are probably three of the best <laughs> prospects in baseball. Uh, fourth inning, he had thrown three scoreless innings, and then uh, Baez, uh, Bryant, and uh, uh, Solar. I mean, they hit bombs. They, 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 they weren't any cheap ones, but... Uh, I, I don't think that's a reason for concern. All right. Um, if that's not a reason for concern, how about Gavin Floyd? Is that a reason for concern, and how does that impact uh, the Indians' rotation? Well, I think it has a direct uh, impact on uh, the rotation. Uh, you know, this was a guy that they said if he was healthy, he was guaranteed a spot, mm. uh, so it affects their depth. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, affects the way... Uh, they're going to prepare for the season, uh, you know. So yeah, it's it's and it's you know basically four million bucks down the drain that they they signed this guy for. Now it's not a lot of money in uh, in you know in, in the terms of major league salary, but it's a uh, it's a lot too for the Indians apparently who you know squeeze every penny until it streams. So uh, it uh, you know so I think it affects them, but right now you know. You look at the rotation, it's basically the same rotation, you know, that had a 2.95 ERA in the second half last year. And, but, they're, you know, the depth is nice, and they're not, they don't have it right now. Uh, Hoinsey, one acquisition from this offseason that is performing well, and it's got to be a big sigh of relief for this team because they need that bat. Brandon Moss is off to as good a start as they could ask. Uh, can this guy uh, he, be that power bat they've been looking for? You know, it's certainly, you know, you, you got to be careful. You get fooled in spring yeah, training, yeah. you know, even by veteran guys and, and rookies alike. But, uh, you know, the, the, the fact is, you know, Moss has done it for the last three years in Oakland. He's, he's hit home runs. He's driven in runs. He's been a power guy. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, I think that, that is a big, big relief for them, especially since, you know, Floyd and, and Moss were the two big offseason acquisitions. One has done – probably for the year, and uh, Moss was coming off a hip operation, and, you know, he's just, he looked great. He swung the bat, and the big thing to me is the two home runs he's had have come off lefties. Lindsay, when we look at the Indians as uh, the opener gets closer and closer here, what is the biggest strength for this team, and what would you say is the one thing that has you concerned going into the year? Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, you know, I think the strength is, is still the bullpen, mm. probably you know, bullpen and bullpen depth, the rotation. You know, you, you lose Floyd, but you still have, you know, you still have Tomlin, you still have McAllister as an option. You know, uh, you know T.J. House and, and Salazar probably win that fourth and fifth spot. Uh, so you got a little depth there, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's a major concern. You know, I, I, I would think the defense is still a concern for me. They haven't played exactly great defense. I mean, it's hard to tell them in Arizona, but, you know, you still got the same cast of characters. Uh, third base, is, it seems to be a concern. You know, so I, I would think third base uh, is, is the biggest concern. And uh, pitching, you know, is still, still a, you know, really a strong point for this club. Uh, Hoinsey Francisco Lindor is having a very nice spring. Of course, Jose Ramirez is expected to be uh, the starting shortstop for this team when camp breaks. First of all, could that change if Lindor continues to play well? And secondly, uh, what kind of spotlight is Jose Ramirez going to have on him if he struggles out of the gate? You know, I'm, uh, you know, I don't think that, I don't think Lindor, Lindor could probably hit 500 and it wouldn't change their mind <laughs> unless you know there was an injury, unless Jose Ramirez got hurt, you know, unless uh, you know something really, or unless he was you know, playing really, really poorly, and he hasn't been. He's been playing okay. Uh, I think they, are, they came with the mindset, the Indians did, that Lindor needs to, to play more in AAA, 
And I think that's the way this is going to break down, even though, you know, like you said, he's played very, very well. Offensively, defensively, you know, he's, he's been, you know, him and Moss, to me, are both the standout players so far this spring. Uh, Hoenzi, who the heck is this guy that's pitching today? I have never heard of him. <laughs> well, well, the reason Kluber, Corey Kluber, scoring a simulated game today, yeah. a four-inning simulated game. Nick Milande is a lefty that they acquired uh, from the Angels during the season. A pretty high prospect uh, draft pick for the Angels. He's, he's pitched in the big leagues the last three years, up and down, mostly out of the bullpen. But he's, you know, he's kind of a depth guy. You know, a guy that can go both ways, like start or relief. But I, the main reason he's starting today is, is because Kluber's thrown the simu simulated game. Well, a couple of years ago when the Indians went on that uh, free agent spending binge and they brought in Nick Swisher, the other guy that they brought in was Michael Bourne. Michael Bourne's been dealing with some injuries since he's been here in Cleveland. What are the expectations for him? You know, uh, Chris, he's looked great, man. He's, he's really looked very, very, uh, you know, he's looked healthy. He's, he swung the bat well. He, you know, last time, his last game two days ago, he was on base four times, got three hits. Uh, he, you know, his, he says there's no problem with his hamstrings. You know, so, you know, the, the expectations are high for him. I mean, you know, Terry, Terry Francona has always already said he wants him to wreak havoc on the bases. <laughs> you know, and he said that in January, and he hasn't changed his tune. So, you know, I would think, uh, you know, this is the guy they signed for a four-year deal. You know, he had two subpar seasons. You know, you're halfway through it. It's uh, – it's time, uh, I think, that they, they want to see the real Michael Bourne, the guy that dominated uh, the base pass in, in the National League. All right, Hoinsey, thanks for the time. Thank you, guys. Love spring training. You, oh, yeah. you get guys out there that you've never heard of, that you'll never hear from again. You've got Will Ferrell trying to play <laughs> 10 positions in one day. Take this thing really seriously uh, down in Arizona and Florida. I was watching one of the games the other day, and I was looking around, and I'm like, who? <laughs> Who? Who? I don't know half these guys. It's unbelievable. Bud Shaw, you got some spinoffs for us? Well, guys, I was out there, and I want to say before I start that uh, Will Ferrell throws harder than Bruce Chen right now. <laughs> I was out there for one of his starts. But, you know, I spent the last 12 days in Arizona watching baseball, and how do the Indians look is a question I often get. At this time of year, the answer is always the same. I can say without fear of contradiction that they look very, very, very tan. And beyond that, I can't tell you much of anything. As Paul said, spring training tends to fool you. Uh, most of the questions and comments I received while I was out there were still about, of course, the Browns. Our first comment today comes from a lifelong Browns fan who says he's upset with ownership for the team not being further ahead than it was 10 years ago and says he's disappointed in what's not happening with the Browns. What's not happening with the Browns is one reason to be upset, I guess, if you're tired of being disappointed in what happens between September and December, which would seem to be the bigger issue. Our second comment comes from Master Fluke. I believe that's a real name, by the way, and says that it's time to stop griping about free agency. It is, after all, only March. And he signs off by saying there will be plenty of time to whine when the season starts. Well, that's the spirit. The third comment is a send-off of sorts to Brian Hoyer, as only Browns fans can. Most cities have welcome wagons, right? We don't have those. We have send-off wagons, where Browns fans roll up as players are packing their things and say this, good luck to another player gone from the abyss of NFL football, which is the passive-aggressive way of saying, please take me with you. Finally, we do have a baseball comment that followed a column I wrote about Trevor Bauer from Goodyear. It says, quote, just about the time he figures out things and pitches well, they will lose him. I've seen this movie. There's another positive thought. Listen, I don't know about that movie. I know that the Indians control Bauer through like the 2020 season, so I wouldn't quite worry about that yet. The ending I foresee if he ever does leave, of course, is somebody congratulating on him on being gone from the abyss of Major League Baseball. Guys? But our, the quarterback situation here in Cleveland is a mess, but... I'm looking at some of these teams that are trying to make quarterback decisions. We're talking about teams yeah. deciding between like Ryan Fitz, Fitzpatrick and, and <laughs> Brian Hoyer and Ryan Mallett. Uh, Jake Locker was one of the top free sure. agents, and he's he's just done. He just decided to hang it up. Well, one, I thought Chris made a great point in that you, you can't 
kill them yet for what they've done, the Browns, but you certainly, you, they don't deserve much praise, right? <laughs> they got a quarterback and a wide receiver, and the best thing we can say is that they still need a quarterback and a wide receiver. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the, that's the issue. I, I did have some interest in Jake Locker because I saw him play fairly well against the Browns this year before getting hurt. Um, I don't know how you guys would feel about it if they did use one of those number ones on Sam Bradford. I don't think it would be a very positive decision in this town, would it or not? In this town? Probably not. In in that area of the studio? <laughs> I would do it. You would do it. I'd trade I'd number do. 19 for Sam Bradford. I think if you I were to make a list um, at the beginning of this offseason and rank the quarterbacks available, mm -hmm. to me, Jameis Winston is one. Sam Bradford was two. Even more so than uh, Mariota. Mar I would rather have Bradford than Mariota because I love like Bradford. Go 12. <laughs> I'm not going to say seven picks is going to be the difference between saying yes yeah. to a guy that could be my answer at quarterback and no. I wouldn't want to go 12. I'd want to push for number 19. I would hope that that would be enough. But look, if the only thing that anybody can say about Sam Bradford is he hasn't been as successful in the NFL as I thought he was going to be because of injury, that tells you that the talent is there, that the quarterback traits are there, and the only thing that has held him back injury and a bad supporting cast. You put him behind this offensive line here in Cleveland, the strength of the team, I think he can play. You have to ask yourself too, what's gonna to help you win more with that 12th pick? Getting Sam Bradford or getting yeah. some defensive tackle? Yeah, Danny Those, Shelton, yeah. <laughs> big time winner right there. Is, is that gonna be the difference between seven wins against a bad schedule and you know what yeah. would be, it's gonna be probably five or six wins this year? No, probably not. Uh, listen, when I heard that story, I thought the same thing. If it was the Browns and they were offering 19, I commend them for, for making the call. To me, I would, I would consider that. I want call? talent more than anything else in this, in this scenario. That'd I don't wanna nice. hear about Josh McCown, you know, being a good choice because he's a good guy who can mentor well, other people. Unless they have Jameis Winston on this team, I don't really care about a mentor. You know what? Being a good choice because he maybe doesn't want to play. You know what? They had a good guy at quarterback last year. Brian Hoyer was a great guy. He threw one touchdown in the final five starts. Well, some would argue that he's not a mentor type because yeah. he wanted to play. Well, I would never hold that against a guy. Right. I want a guy who thinks he can start. He, he wasn't Seneca Wallace standing down at the 20-yard line while the other quarterback was, was in the <laughs> huddle. So, I mean, uh, he's not, he wasn't a bad guy who didn't want to mentor anyone. He saw what a, a, a scenario where he was the best quarterback option for that team, regardless of what you thought of him. Right. So, he wasn't Seneca Wallace. <laughs> there you go. There's, <laughs> enough, there's some more. Huh? Let's end it with that high praise. <laughs> All right. That's it for Sports Insider. Join us again next week, Thursday at noon. We'll have another live show. If you missed any of this show, we'll have the archive up shortly this afternoon. Thanks to Joe Varden, Mary Kay Cabot, and Paul Hoynes for joining us. Bud Shaw as well. Chris Fedor. I'm Dan Lobby. Thanks for watching.